Hello, welcome to the Tolkien Collector's Guide YouTube channel, where we gather experts from around the world to discuss Tolkien's books and the people who read them. I'm Guru Loke, and with me are Trotter and Mr. Underhill. Welcome, everyone, to the Tolkien Collector's Guide. I'm Jeremy. With me are Chad and Trotter, as usual. And today we're very excited to talk with Dr. Tom Shippey about his new book, which is Beowulf and the North Before the Vikings. Uh, we've uh, all had a chance to read it. It came out uh, about one month ago, so it's available from your normal uh, bookstore retailers in the UK, the US, and elsewhere uh, it's a fascinating book. Uh, Dr. Shippey, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about why you wrote it. Uh, well, uh, one reason, of course, is that everybody told me it was a bad idea, a really bad idea. Um, the um, People don't agree about anything with Beowulf, but something they agree about much more than anything else uh, is that it's useless as a historical document. And that's a quote, actually, from uh, from a Swedish historian. But they all say uh, much the same kind of thing. The modern editors have said, you know, uh, no, 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 no. The search for history in Beowulf is a chimera uh, and uh, various disobliging things like that. And this has become such a sort of fixed opinion that, uh, you know, I wondered whether anyone, why anyone had ever thought anything else. And after a bit, I started looking into it. And I think that... Um, the first, the first thing is I think a lot of this was Tolkien's fault. He was the one who, in 1936, told everybody that they'd got to stop thinking about Beowulf as a historical document, which they had been, and start treating it as what it was, which was a fantasy. It's really a, a fairy tale about a troll and a dragon and a water hag, and uh, pretending it's something else is quite mistaken. Well, um... I thought, well, that's true enough. That's true enough. Um, but there are several things you might question in it. And furthermore, since 1936, which after all is, uh, what is it, 86 years ago, um, things have turned up which Tolkien couldn't possibly know about. And, uh, and we ought to take those into consideration as well. So first, I was being contradictory. Uh, second, I was trying to be uh, up to date. Uh, and third, well, um, I felt I was having a kind of dialogue with Tolkien. There was Tolkien in 1936, which is the famous, uh, um, um, the famous uh, lecture, which uh, we all know about and which uh, has been almost universally praised. But then there are other things which actually you can see because uh, Trotter's got them behind him. There's a Tolkien, uh, the translation and commentary, which came out in 2014. And there's also actually one that uh, uh, I don't think you have got uh, uh, there. Let me see. I'm holding it up to the camera. That's it. It's uh, Finn and Hengist. Posthumous work edited by Alan Bliss. Came out in, I think it was 1982. But nobody took any notice of it. It's quite clear from Finn and Hengist and from the, the Beowulf translation and commentary, that uh, Tolkien took Beowulf as a historical document very seriously indeed. And he had some very good ideas about it. And he published them too, or at least they were published after he died. But no one took any notice because they'd been convinced by what he said many years before. So I thought we ought to start uh, investigating, shall we say, uh, what Tolkien said in the first place and what he said later on and what I would have liked to tell him, you know, in the modern day if I had any way of communicating with him. So I think those were, those are the reasons why I got started on it. Excellent. Yeah, so your book goes into quite a bit of detail at the first section talking about the archaeological research you did with the assistance of, you know, a lot of experts from uh, this region and around the world. Mm. So what what kind of, for someone who hasn't read the book yet, what kind of architectural, or, I'm sorry, what kind of archaeological uh, relations did you find between the poem and, and historical fact that they've, they've been uncovering? Well, um, uh, the poem, it's quite clear that the Danish uh, dynasty, which Beowulf visits, uh, is the uh, Schildings. 
and the Schildings in Old Norse are the Skildungar. They're the same word, different pronunciations. And in Danish tradition, the uh, stronghold, uh, the capital of the Skildungar was a place called uh, Hledargather or Hledra or Hledro, variation, uh, variations in spelling. And it's been realized for a long time, I think, that that is the, the present small village of Gamla Leira. Gamla Leira, not very far from Copenhagen. Um, but until quite recently, everybody said, oh, yes, yes, but, you know, it just can't be true. I mean, Gamla Leira, is, it isn't even a village, you know. It's kind of uh, um, five houses in a little museum. Uh, and anyway, I won't, I won't say anything more about that, but it seems to be completely impossible. And then from what I've heard, and this is mere gossip, you know, um, what happened was that uh, at the Roskilde Museum, Roskilde being the big town nearest to Leira, uh, some guy walked in and said, uh, hey, uh, look what I found. And he held out something to the, uh, the archaeologists, and I don't even know what it was. But they looked at it and they thought, hmm, that's interesting. Where did you find it? Oh, at Leira, he said. So the archaeologists then got their buckets and spades out and went to have a look. And uh, in a way, they, they didn't really believe what they found. Um, they kept finding things. Every time you stuck a spade in the ground, you might say, you know, you got another result. So uh, I tried to summarize this in my book, and I, I couldn't really. Uh, they kept finding one giant, enormous hall after another or I should say the traces of a giant enormous hall. And I'm not quite sure how many there were because they kept her being knocked down and rebuilt. Uh, and uh, the, the total, well, I don't know. But if you want to want to look at it, Google King's Hall Leira. That's L-E-J-R-E. -E, because the Danes, who take archaeology very seriously, have actually built a replica of one of these halls. And you look at it and you think, Blimey, it's, it's, it's all, all wooden, but it's the size of a cathedral. So, obviously, the, uh, the, the traditional seat of the Skildingar, or the Shieldings, really was a power center, and a power center for hundreds of years. Well, uh, the, the, the replica is actually later than the Beowulfian period, but the hall, uh, Who's, which is pictured on the front of my book, which you can see there, that's uh, um, an artist's impression of one which was uh, around in the Beowulfian era. That is the kind of hall that Beowulf would have visited. So <coughs> that was the first thing. That was the first thing. But once I started asking about it, um, I discovered there was a lot more, uh, a lot more. Um, actually, I had one kind of accidental conversation with uh, Franz Heskend, who's now professor of archaeology at Uppsala. Uh, and uh, we'd just been to a, uh, a session on Beowulf in a conference, and it was terrible, terrible, you know, awful stuff. Um, and we came out looking gloomy, and I, I was talking to him, and I said uh, something like, um, you know, I've always wondered about uh, that line right at the start of Beowulf when it says that... Uh, Schild, the, the ancestor of the Schildings, um, Schild took away the mead benches from many tribes. Um, I, I think that means really that he's uh, taking away the mead halls, doesn't it? Because the mead hall is the kind of administrative center. Uh, and I, I said something like that. And Heskin looked at me and he said, but that's just what we're finding. And I said, huh? or something intelligent like that. And he said, no, he said, we keep coming across them. These are halls which have been deliberately smashed. And the word he said was smashed. They haven't been plundered. They've been, you know, um, uh, knocked down, the, po the posts taken away, uh, uh, the whole thing turfed over. On one occasion, at least, a kind of um, memorial erected of broken weapons and all these are, are well, one can only say, uh, deliberate attempts to destroy the autonomy of pre-national states, shall we say, of tribes. There's the Schildings, okay, and there's the Helmings, okay, and there's the Brondings, and there's the Wolfings. But actually, the Schildings are taking over all the others. 
and somewhere along the line, they're all being taught to call themselves not Brondings or Helmings or whatever. They're got, going to call themselves Dena, Danes. And I think that means flatlanders. The Danes are the flatlanders, which is exactly what Denmark is, to tell the truth. So uh, we're looking at uh, the archaeology then seems to me to confirm, or you might put it another way, Beowulf is saying in an abbreviated and rather poetic form uh, something which makes complete sense archaeologically. It's a, it's a roll-up process. It's a takeover bid. Well, it's not a takeover bid. It's a takeover. Um, and that is uh, what the poet is talking about right at the start. Well, so... What with one thing and another, uh, and as I say, really, when I started looking, they, they kept on, uh, I kept on finding more and more confirmation of this. So that was a, another, another stimulus to, uh, to, to get into this. Um, well, g going back to, to Tolkien, uh, he, of course, was uh, dead set on saying it's a fantasy. It's not a historical document. It looks like a historical document, but it's not a historical document. It's a fantasy. It's about dragons. Yeah. Is it possible that Tolkien had some kind of personal motive for suggesting that fantasy was an important literary form? Um, could it be that he had been writing fantasy for 20 years in secret about dragons and trolls, and he was now going to come out? In fact, he had come out. The, I've got the dates here. He gave the, the lecture on um, 25th November 1936, and uh, slightly less than eight weeks before, he handed in The Hobbit, the typescript of The Hobbit, to his publishers. And The Hobbit, as you will remember, has in it a dragon and trolls and, of course, dwarves and elves and the original feature, The Hobbit. But uh, Tolkien then... <laughs> You couldn't find a person with a bigger motive for saying uh, fantasy is important. So, okay, right. Furthermore, and uh, I say this as decorously as I can, um, Tolkien was quite obviously kidding. He was kidding his audience. And I think, uh, uh, <laughs> I think that Tolkien thought it was funny. Uh, he did have a strong sense of humor, uh, and it, it was a, sometimes, I thought, rather wicked. But uh, one thing I noticed, I've got it here. Here's the uh, the famous lecture, and Tolkien is, of course, saying that uh, dragons are a really, uh, really good topic for literature, and he says um, they're more important than heroes. He says, even today you may find men not ignorant of tragic legend and history who have heard of heroes and indeed seen them, who yet have been caught by the fascination of the worm. More than one poem in recent years has been inspired by the dragon of Beowulf. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There had been more than one poem. There had been two. Um, one was written by Tolkien, and the other was written by his best friend, C.S. Lewis. So what Tolkien was really telling his uh, distinguished and learned audience was, uh, well, uh, um, you may think dragons are rather childish, but I like dragons. And what's more, my best friend likes dragons. So there. <laughs> but of course, he didn't put it like that, did he? Um, but that's what it was. Uh, Tolkien, I think, was... Uh, we know, incidentally, because uh, Michael Drought has edited the drafts of Tolkien's uh, lecture. And at that point in the lecture, <laughs> he went to the trouble of writing out his poem and... C.S. Lewis's poem in full. So we know those are the two <laughs> poems that he was talking about. Well, okay, I think uh, more than one poem is, uh, um, well, uh, um, it's, not, it's not a lie, uh, but it does actually mislead the audience considerably, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, it's almost Sorry, like uh, Tolkien was using this lecture as a uh, as an advertisement or as a preliminary book tour for, for the upcoming Hobbit. And, and oh, no, he would never do that. He, was, he never wanted that to sell. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
I, I, I won't go so far as that, to say that, but uh, as I say, he did have a personal motive for making the claims that he did, and I'm not disagreeing with him. I think it's, it's quite right. Uh, uh, fantasy is an important literary genre, and I like dragons too. That's okay. Um, but uh, uh, going from that to saying, because it's a fantasy, it can't be a historical document, that's quite wrong. Um, if there's one thing that is obvious, well, no, no, no. I think it is obvious about Beowulf that it is layered. There's a fantasy mm -hmm. layer and there's a historical layer. And you can tell them apart quite easily, actually. It's, it's all built into the poem. So it is both a historical document and a fantasy. It's a fantasy embedded in uh, a, histo a historical background. Well, can we believe the historical background? Well, okay, we've got Lyra to look at. Uh, we've got um, other uh, rather striking pieces of evidence. Um, and uh, we also have a date. People say, you know, you can't write history without a date, without dates and documents. And Beowulf, of course, doesn't, doesn't give any references. There's no footnotes in it. But just the same, we have got a date and we have got documents to support it. And those are very important and entirely accidental. Shall I yeah, tell you tell what us a little are? bit more about that. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, tell us about that, Dr. Sherry. Well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think the first thing that Beowulf, uh, uh, act, uh, when, when Beowulf is introduced, he's not given a name. It just says he's Higelax Thane. And when he in introduces himself, he doesn't immediately say, my name is Beowulf. He says, we are Higelax Hearth Companions. So he mentions Higelac again and again and again. Uh, and uh, curiously, it's not until quite late on that we realize that uh, Higelac is Beowulf's uncle. Uh, so indeed, uh, Beowulf is his sister's son, a very close relationship in Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, uh, who's this guy Higelac? Well, um, he's the king of the Yats. Who are the Yats? We don't know anything about them. Uh, well, actually, we do know one thing about them, and that is because at one moment they sailed out of the complete darkness of uh, the uh, uh, the Scandinavian north uh, and uh, impinged on the Frankish Empire, which, of course, had people in it who could read and write, um, and they wrote, wrote down an account. Uh, Beowulf makes it clear with several references that Higelac led a raiding expedition against the Frankish Empire, uh, which was cut off and completely wiped out. Um, a disaster. Uh, and uh, this disaster was recorded by Frankish chroniclers. Uh, they, of course, the man's name back in the, in the, in the period we're talking about would have been something like Hugilekas. Higelac is the Ang is the later Anglo-Saxon version of it. And uh, they wrote this down variously, but one of the better uh, attempts was Hochilecus. Hugilecas, Hochilecus. Yes, that's the same guy. Uh, so this disaster for Beowulf's uncle took place, and we know when it took place, because it took place in the reign of King Theodoric, uh, king of the Franks, 511 to 534. But it must have been quite late on in the reign because the commander of the Frankish army was his son, Prince Theodobert, and he must have been fairly adult, adult enough to be given even um, uh, a figurehead command of an army. So most people say 525. I think it's a bit later. I think the, the, the Frankish disaster, the Higelac disaster, took place about the year 530. So Beowulf is set in the period before the Higelac disaster and then after the Higelac disaster. That is kind of, uh, you might almost say, the, 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 the chronological pivot of the poem. So we got a date and we got a confirmation that an obscure king from the most obscure dynasty, some, something, a dynasty we know almost nothing about, nevertheless really existed. And if he really existed, then it seems very likely that the other people from better authenticated dynasties, they existed too. So one of the things the poet says is absolutely solidly confirmed, dates and documents. So we can start off from that. 
and uh, that's uh, that. And without that, I must say, we'd be rather stuck. But with that, well, that uh, that gives you uh, a kind of situation. And there's another thing I think which uh, which struck me uh, about this time. Um, I think that this disaster took place about the year 530. But it wasn't the only disaster mm -hmm. that took place about the year 530. And again, this is something we're dead sure of. Um, sometime, probably at about 535, there was a violent volcanic eruption somewhere or other. Many people suggest it was in central Mexico. And this enormous volcanic eruption threw cubic kilometers of dust and ash into the atmosphere. Well, some of you probably remember, as I do, what happened to air flights when there was a relatively minor volcanic eruption in Iceland. Uh, you know, we, we were all, all, all air travel was off for a while across the whole northern hemisphere. I was stuck in Newark Airport for days. God, I didn't like that. Anyway, sorry. Um, well, uh, this eruption was much, much bigger, and it created a dust veil which was reported everywhere from China to Byzantium. And the dust veil, of course, took place a little after the eruption. There was 536 was the year with no summer. Now, everybody suffered from this. Even Britain suffered from it. It's mentioned again in, in, in one of the few British documents we have. But Scandinavia suffered worse because it's far north. It has a short growing season uh, and it has a rather marginal agriculture. So the estimate is that about half the population of Scandinavia died of famine, of starvation. Um, so that was, we got the, 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 the military disaster. We got the, uh, the, the dust veil and, and the famine. Uh, it was followed up, it seems, by a plague which came up from uh, the south. And uh, also the archaeology shows um, uh, in, I could, you can only say that uh, that before this, Scandinavia was having a kind of golden age with lots of discoveries of gold hoards and rich burials, and then they stop. They they just stop. You don't mm -hmm. find any anymore. Um, uh, and that's bad, of course. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's a kind of economic disaster. But I was arguing that in the kind of society that Beowulf talked about, it's not just an economic disaster. Um, and I said, that's because you've got to think of um, mathems. What's a mathem? Tolkien fans ought to know what a mathem yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Well, it's, well, it's the gifts, that is, yeah. Yeah, yeah gifts. Uh, and the, the, thing, the thing about mathems, mathmas in, in Old English, which you mentioned many times in Beowulf, is that uh, they've got to circulate. You know, they get passed mm -hmm. around. Their presence, you keep giving them. Of course, in uh, in the Shire, this is kind of comic. Uh, they're passing around the kind of stuff you find on the on the bric-a-brac stall in the village fete. Uh, you know, <laughs> you see them coming round again and again. But uh, in the Beowulf world, they're much more important than that because the Beowulf world has no money. It has no money. Mm -hmm. It only has mathmas. But the mathmas are important not not just because of their kind of bullion value. They're important because they're markers of prestige. And the kings have to have them. If they haven't got mathmas to hand out, they've got no retainers. Um, and <coughs> the retainers have to have them because <coughs> if they haven't got them, you can't tell whether they're important people or not. In Beowulf, there's one mm -hmm. point when uh, Beowulf is going home and he meets the Coast Guard who's been looking after his ship and he gives him a, 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 a valuable sword and he says, it's just... You know, it's just, a, it's just a comment that uh, ever afterwards, the Coast Guard was uh, uh, the worthier for the Matham on the mead bench. In other words, when he went in with his elaborate sword, everybody realized this is an important person. This is, uh, this is one of the top people. So the Mathamas are vitally important. But there weren't any anymore. The supply had been cut off. The supply had been cut off, and uh, that's, as I say, the kind of uh, poverty and dearth of gold and silver which strikes the Scandinavian world, you know, round about the 530s. Quite what causes it, we don't know.
But Beowulf actually says uh, quite, uh, quite, you know, as, as a casual thing, uh, that um, ever since the Higelac disaster, we have not had the favor of the Merovingian. And the Merovingian mm-hmm. is the Frankish king. And what they're saying is, effectively, uh, since we're uh, uh, really unpopular down south, uh, the, the valuable stuff isn't coming anymore. We've been shut out. It's like the Russians cutting off the gas at the moment. Uh, everybody suddenly <laughs> yep. gets poor. So uh, quite what psychological effect that had on uh, on the kind of Scandinavian society. Well, I was trying to guess at it uh, and trying to figure it out. But certainly it would be a very bad psychological effect. So there are all these indications of um, what one of my archaeological friends calls, he says, it's the, the central cultural trauma of Scandinavia. It's something that it took them hundreds of years to get over. So, and that's exactly the situation that Beowulf is uh, reporting. Only Beowulf says it's not a result of famine or plague. <coughs> it's a result of uh, uh, the royal families uh, wiping each other out. It's civil war and domestic war and all kinds of war. And the result of it is there's no survivors. Well, there's almost no survivors. But... Uh, that seems to me to make sense as well, because when resources run out, what happens? People fight much harder for what's left. So it's yeah. all, I think, a response to, as I say, a central cultural trauma. Um, and uh, you can't say, actually, you can't, you can't put dates on it all. But I, I went so far as to um, work out a kind of order of events. And actually, Tolkien went much further than that in his... Uh, translation and commentary on Beowulf, he, he provided a chronology of, uh, of how he thinks went and w- when, when things happened. I thought that was a bit bold, but then, uh, then Tolkien was bold. And I'm not saying he was wrong either. Um, he agreeing with it. I, I would say it might not be right to the year, but it's pretty close to uh, the, the facts as we established them. And Tolkien had some very good ideas, actually, about uh, what was really happening, which, uh, which uh, again, have, been, uh, have never really been taken into consideration. So, so Tolkien did his modern translation in the mid-1920s, right? Uh, it didn't get published until 2014, but uh, from, from what I understand of the manuscripts, he, he had been working on it back when he was giving these lectures to his students, the, the lecture notes that are published with the commentary uh, in, in the 2014 volume. So, so he was working really in depth on the historical, you know, ties of of the Beowulf poem before he gave the the Monsters and the Critics lecture in 1936. Yeah, yeah, but we also know that Tolkien, uh, I think I could say, never left anything alone. Um, he was always rewriting. He never stopped rewriting. I mean, even later on, he was trying to rewrite The Hobbits till somebody persuaded him not to. I think the uh, lectures, the commentary as published, which is incomplete, um, mm-hmm. it, well, we, we, we don't know exactly when uh, he, uh, he uh, uh, said these things. But, um, well, here's another thing. Um, going back to um, Finn and Hengist, very interesting book, very interesting theory, which explains uh, puzzles which have baffled uh, all other scholars. Uh, But it's very hard to make out what Tolkien thought, because, well, he was a a niggler. He loved detail. Mm -hmm. He kept on piling on detail. And sometimes there's so much detail, you know, you you can't see the wood for the trees. Um, Shall I tell you a quick anecdote about him? Oh, um, please. Yes, not, absolutely. Not mine. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, uh, mentors when I was a fellow at Oxford was uh, Marilyn Butler. And Marilyn Butler was older than me. And she was actually a kind of grand dame, you know, uh, uh, very aristocratic, um, uh, quite kind to me. Uh, but uh, she thought I was a bit of she thought I was naive, to tell the truth. Uh, anyway, she said that. Um, <laughs> When she was an undergraduate at Oxford, they had to do a, an exam paper on Old English, and she didn't know anything about it and wasn't interested. So she thought she'd better go to a Tolkien lecture to find out what he thought. So she turned up at Tolkien's lecture on Beowulf and sat there in the front row with her 
notebook and pen out, uh, and it tur- he turned up, and she realized after a bit that he'd got to about line 72, and that he was progressing at the rate of about 20 lines a week. And she thought, what's the chances of him saying something in this lecture about line 72 to 94, shall we say, which I can use in my exam in three weeks' time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much none. So she, so she Zero. got up and passed her way out, um, which must have been rather embarrassing all around. But she said she wasn't going to waste an hour. And that was Tolkien, really. Uh, uh, we know he was a niggler. We know he got fascinated by detail. And he had a terrible tendency not to finish things. So um, I think we've got to say that his work on Beowulf was always a kind of work in progress. Uh, anyway, Finn and Hengist has a kind of interesting theory in it, but it's actually quite hard to to work it out. Um, however, there was something I noticed again by accident, and this is now years and years ago. There's a children's book, and it's called Hengist. Okay. Hengist with uh, with an I, H E N G I S T, and it's by um, uh, Jill Payton Walsh, a well-known children's author. Uh, but I, I, I discovered, and I, I, I don't know quite how I discovered this, but her maiden name was Bliss. And mm-hmm. I actually contacted her, and she said, yes, oh, yes, Alan Bliss was my uncle. Uh, and uh, when I was at Oxford, I was tutored by Tolkien. So there are two mm-hmm. ways how she could have worked out the thesis of Tolkien's book, Finn and Hengist. One, from her uncle, and two, perhaps from Tolkien. He might have told her. Anyway, her children's book, gives the central idea and core of Tolkien's, uh, Tolkien's analysis of the Finsburg event, uh, uh, you know, in, in a comprehensible form. And I strongly suggest that, that you read it and then you'll, then you'll know what Tolkien meant. After you've read it, you could then read Finn and Hengist and you'd probably work out then what Tolkien was talking about. Um, but uh, it fits very well, the archaeological and historical record and uh, once again, I thought this was, uh, uh, I think people ought to know this, actually. It's, uh, it's part of history. And it's, uh, it also shows Tolkien's uh, astonishing originality. I mean, people had been arguing the toss about Finsburg for, for generations. And nobody had come up with anything very much. And then Tolkien kind of solved it for them. If, if you accept his theory, which uh, I see no reason not to. Shall I tell you what the it's, theory it's a, is? Well, um, that, uh, please do. We, we have two Anglo-Saxon poems about it. One is Beowulf and the other is something called the Finsburg Fragment. And it's clear mm-hmm. that um, uh, a group of people called Half Danes are attacked at night in a hall in a treacherous sort of way. And the hall is in, the, at the, in Finsburg, the capital of the Frisians, whose king is Finn. But the people who are doing the attacking are Jutes. Jutes, you know, people from Jutland. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Hengist, if he's the man, he's the brother of, you know, Hengist and Horta Hengist, the man who founded the Kingdom of Kent, he's a Jute as well. So what the hell's going on? <laughs> Tolkien said, the clue is really in the word half Danes. Uh, the Danes have been expanding from uh, from Lera, um across the, the Danish islands, and they finally reach Jutland. And now, are they going to be able to take over the Jutes? Well, they have, because Jutland is now part of Denmark. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it wasn't then, or should we say the, the matter was still in the balance. And Tolkien suggests that what happened at Finsburg was that the half-Danes in the hall, uh, uh, making some kind of alliance with the Frisians, were actually um, Jutish collaborators, Jutes who had oh. given in and uh, taken the part of the Danes. Um, meanwhile, uh, the guys who are attacking them are what you might call, World War II terms, the free Jutes in exile, who are actually mm-hmm. rallying round the last royal prince of the Jutish dynasty. And, of course, the two sides hate each other bitterly. It's uh, collaborators against loyalists, you might say. It's a, it's a last of the Moican situation. And uh, this is what Tolkien suggested. And it accounts for the fact that there appear to be Jutes on both sides 
uh, and for the fact that there is this immense hostility between them and that uh, also we have, uh, uh, as it were, on the sidelines, the Frisians on one side and the Danes on the other and the half Danes, which may be a way of saying quislings or, or as I say, collaborators in the middle. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's the story. And uh, of course, it, it, uh, it links up quite well with what we know about history. It's the right sort of date for a start. Um, and uh, Hengist is a rare name. There's only two people mm -hmm. we know of called Hengist. One's the one in Beowulf and one's the one who invaded Kent. So are they the same guy? Well, makes Possibly. good sense. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, you have a, a situation where uh, somebody like Hengist is uh, bad news all over the continent of Europe. Uh, and what's he going to do? He's going to... Um, He's going to bail out and try and uh, uh, make a living elsewhere. And that kind of thing uh, also, well, it seems to me that uh, in this central cultural trauma with everybody knocking spots off each other in Denmark and Sweden, um, the losers have got to, got to, got to get out because uh, it's going to be a no survivors situation. So they've got to get out. And I think there's evidence of a kind which suggests that the losers in these terrible uh, internal domestic disputes uh, quit and went to England. Um, some of them went to Kent, some of them went to East Anglia, and some of them went to North Yorkshire. Uh, and uh, we have got some kind of traces of, uh, of these people, mostly uh, through names. Um, and that actually, it does two other things. It does two other things. One is it explains why an Englishman is writing a poem about something that happened in Scandinavia hundreds of years ago because it happened to his ancestors. It wasn't mm -hmm. their history. It was his history. It was his history and his audience's history. They remembered some of this stuff because it was family history. Yeah. And the other thing it explains, the um, Viking Age is normally considered to have started with the attack on Lindisfarne in 793. And this was the, uh, the Pearl Harbor of the Dark Ages. Everybody was taken by surprise. Um, Alcuin, writing a report on it uh, to, to, to his king, said, um, uh, we just never imagined this kind of thing would happen. It, it's too, we've been here 250 years and nothing like this has ever happened before. And I thought, well, that's kind of dumb, isn't it? Uh, how did Alcuin think the Angles and the Saxons got there? Where did they come from? They were actually raiders from across the sea. But the surprising thing actually is not that there were raids from the continent onto England. That had been going on since Roman times. The Romans built a whole chain of signal stations down the coast to watch for invading fleet. I'm getting overexcited. The surprising thing is, uh, is uh, not that there was a sudden raid on Lindisfarne. The surprising thing is that everyone was surprised because there'd been a, a stoppage. <laughs> the endemic mm -hmm. raiding from the continent to England had stopped for, well, Alcuin says 350 years, but I think it was more like 250 years. Um, you might say that here we've got Higelac being wiped out in 530 and uh, the attack on Lindisfarne 263 years later. And in between those two, there had been a cessation of piratical activity. And one reason was um, it wasn't paying, was it? It was a disaster. Don't do that again. And the other was there'd been a kind of, uh, I guess we would say, uh, economic recession in Scandinavia, uh, uh, along, <laughs> along with, of course, a, a very serious population loss. And uh, uh, the urge to go uh, raiding other people wasn't there anymore. They'd, they'd lost confidence. Uh, it took them 250 years to get over the events of the, shall we say, 530s. Um, so uh, that was why uh, uh, everybody was so bloody surprised, which is, as I say, a surprise in itself. As for um, the, uh, the, uh, the evidence for um, uh, characters from Beowulf turning up in English history, well, <clears throat> there's a, 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 an old argument between myself and uh, Sam Newton, 
uh, and Sam is the director of events at Sutton Hoo, the big archaeological site. And Sam, mm. you realise I am perhaps a little prejudiced here. Sam, between you and me, is a Suffolk <laughs> chauvinist. He thinks that everything important <laughs> happened in Suffolk. And I... Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> a completely neutral person to point out that actually everything important happened in North Yorkshire. Um, and we've, we've actually of we've had two debates. Shocking. One Shocking held takes in Suffolk, and, and, uh, and, and, and Sam won that because he packed the bloody audience, if you ask me. And there was one in North mm. Yorkshire, and I won that because I had packed the bloody audience. So uh, the event <laughs> remains obscure. But uh, uh, there is something to be said for both sides. Sam's uh, point is that uh, one of the very minor characters in Beowulf is someone called Hrothmund, a very rare name. In fact, there's only two people we know of called Hrothmund. Are they the same guy? Probably. And uh, Hrothmund is the, uh, one of the ancestors of the East Anglian kings. So the losers in the Danish civil war go to East Anglia. The losers in the Jutish civil war go to uh, Kent. And... Uh, the Yeats, who are not having a civil war, but who are about to be taken over by the Swedes from the north, um, they go to North Yorkshire. And uh, I found a few place names which actually rather back this up, which hadn't been noticed before. So we got three uh, emigrations uh, from uh, different parts of Scandinavia to different parts of England, uh, but all uh, powered by this uh, unfortunate... Uh, 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 social collapse, which took place in the early 6th century. Um, so, uh, uh, that makes sense. There are some other things I could say, and some of it... Well, well you know. I, I, far be it for me to slow you down. <laughs> One question I had, you mentioned something earlier uh, in our conversation that I'm, I'm hoping you could elucidate uh, a little further on, was uh, your book is kind of uh, you know, having a conversation between young Tolkien and old Tolkien. And I wonder if you could uh, explain a little further what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Tolkien, as I say, obviously took Beowulf very seriously as history. And he, uh, he was very good at pointing out uh, how logical things were if you thought about it properly. For instance, at the start of the poem, Beowulf turns up and he said to at Hrothgar's court, Hrothgar, king of the Danes, and he says, well, we are Higelax men. Isn't that kind of tactless? Because Higelax has just killed the Swedish king, Ongentheo, and started a blood feud um, with the Swedes. And actually, Hrothgar's niece, or possibly daughter-in-law, because there's an element of incest here, which I... I, I wouldn't even try to explain. But anyway, <clears throat> one of his close relatives is married to Onela, who will later be king of the Swedes. Um, so isn't it tactless for Beowulf to turn up and say, look, I am the loyal servitor of your close relative's deadly enemy? Should, is it, how, how would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, Tolkien pointed out that if you actually think about what Beowulf tells us, uh, right about this time, Ongentheo is dead. He has two sons, Ochtera and Onela. Um, Onela will become king of the Swedes, but perhaps he hasn't become king yet, because his elder brother is Ochtera. How do we know Ochtera is his elder brother? Well, because uh, Ochtera's sons rebelled against Onela. And the way that seems likely to have happened is that Ochtera succeeds his father. Um, he then dies. His sons expect to succeed him, but their uncle decides to take over instead. So they rebel. But if that's the case, then at the moment Beowulf turns up, Onela is basically nobody. He is the, the brother of a, of a king who has two uh, two sons, and who is furthermore the king of a very reduced realm because they've just been uh, hammered by the Yats. So actually, Onela is not an important person at this point. He will be later, but not at the point when Beowulf turns up. And Tolkien is very good at kind of uh, fitting scraps of information together and saying, look, this gives us a kind of diplomatic picture. 
uh, you can see why Hrothgar is sucking up to King Higelac, because he's the coming man. He's the, he's the danger man at the moment. You can see that uh, he might well change his, change his opinion later, and he probably had a different opinion before all of this hinted at in the poem. So actually the poem has a very clear political um, vision, uh, and not just extending to Scandinavia. And uh, if you believe it, then it actually makes things uh, really uh, plausible, uh, accurate, comprehensible. Um, so uh, uh, I think Tolkien is very good at, uh, at piecing together scraps of information, as we know from, you know from Lord of the Rings, which is full of piecing together <laughs> scraps of information. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think, as I say, uh, Tolkien is quite right to say that the poem should be treated as a fantasy, uh, but it is also correct to say that it can be treated as a historical document, and the one does not eliminate the other. You don't have to choose between them. They're both. Uh, and, you know, I, I, make, I make the argument kind of structurally. You can, as I say, it's a layered poem, and you can pick the layers apart without any difficulty at all. It's, it's obvious. Okay, uh, let me think. What, uh, what, what, what else can I, uh, can I suggest to you? Um, hmm. Well, a, a, any, any questions Bye. so far? Well, I have a I have a question for you, Doctor Shippey, about. Um, well, first of all, I I want to say, but while I've got this opportunity, um, that uh, I've been a fan of yours ever since I I read The Road to Middle Earth uh, twenty years ago, and then I pretty much immediately read Author of the Century after that. So um, you've you've been my favorite Tolkien scholar from day one. So I wanted to get that out there. Um, well, thanks very much. The, uh, um... I was. I was reading your um, your new book, which is fascinating. Um, I I know you have a section in there about um, the translation of Beowulf, and I know Tolkien talks about he has several articles that he wrote throughout his life on the on the translating of Beowulf, and we mm -hmm. we know that, or we or we can suppose that Beowulf was translated in two sections by two different two different translators. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that for people that don't know, and maybe talk about a little bit about the possible agenda that the translators had writing about a pre-Christian era coming, writing during, you know, a, a Christian era. Yeah. Well, um, I don't think it's quite right to call them translators. What, what happens is that uh, okay. about two thirds of the way through the poem, the handwriting changes. Um, and that is very important because it enables us to date the time when the poem was copied. Um, because the, uh, the funny thing is that um, um, you, you, you would expect, as it were, if there's a, a kind of an older and a newer style of handwriting, that uh, uh, it would start off with the older style, and then the old guy dies or has a stroke or something, and, and somebody comes in with the newer style of handwriting. But actually, in Beowulf, typically, it's the other way around, um, that uh, the, the modern guy stops and the, the more old-fashioned guy takes over. But uh, anyway, we get, that gives us a kind of um, a date because there was only a short time when these two kinds of handwriting coexisted. So we're, we're quite sure that the poem got written down about the year 1000, which, of course, is nearly 500 years after the events of the poem, which we also have a very solid date for. So there's a kind of nearly 500-year gap in between um, uh, the, the copy we've got and the, the events uh, uh, described. And I often ask people, actually, just as a a kind of uh, uh, check on this. Um, what is the earliest thing that you know about which you net got not from reading anything, but from conversation, from talking to old people, perhaps? <laughs> any, any suggestions? How long does your oral or your family memory go back? Not documentary. Yeah, I'd, I'd say like maybe three generations back, three or four generations back. Probably. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's, that's certainly, uh, I mean, certainly true in my case, because my grandfather told me all about the First World War. Um, but actually, mine goes a bit further back, because when I was quite young, I met an old man who uh, told me that he had actually ridden in South Africa on the Jameson Raid. At the time, I didn't know what the 
Jameson Raid was, and I'm still not too sure. But that's about 1870, I think. So here I am in 2022, and I have a memory, not a very good one, of something that happened 150 years before. Well, mm -hmm. um, I suspect that in, uh, in a, a, an era when people didn't read and write, uh, history was uh, taken much more seriously, uh, being passed on mouth to mouth. People wanted to know about their grandfathers and their grandfathers' grandfathers, which nowadays people hardly ever do know. But um, that means, I think, that uh, that information like this, stories like this, could well be passed on. I wouldn't say for five hundred years, but uh, I, I think Beowulf was actually written as opposed to copied maybe two hundred years after the event, and I can quite see two hundred years as a a reasonable stretch for memory to uh, to cover especially in a society where memory is very important. So uh, um, uh, uh, I think that, that uh, uh, all this makes the, 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 this, the background of the poem more plausible. And here's another thing that, that Tolkien said, which I thought was very clever. He said he thought the real achievement of the Beowulf poet, the real achievement was that he picked exactly the right moment in which to set his poem. It's a poem about a troll and a water hag and a dragon, but he, mm -hmm. he set it, uh, well, m my way of putting it is he set it in the period just before the roof fell in for Scandinavia, just before the central cultural trauma. And the, the central cultural trauma takes place in between the first two thirds of the poem and the last third of the poem. And uh, uh, one other thing I'd say, which is pretty pretty ghastly really um it was obviously it was obviously um uh i think the archaeologists say carefully a time of great stress well i would say rather more than that actually one of the the halls that they investigated in sweden was in a place called upokra and at upokra they found a hall which had been burned down fairly standard, and there were people uh, uh, in the hall when it was burned down, fairly standard, and they'd all been left there well. And at that point, the archaeologists realized that the bodies had been eaten by dogs. Mm -hmm. So this was in the middle of a town, but they burned the hall down, they left the people in it, and they let the dogs eat them. Well, towards the end of the poem, Beowulf, the, the messenger says, now Beowulf's dead, we're for it, you know. Uh, we're, we're all going to get killed. We're for the chop. And we will be left for the, uh, the wolf and the eagle to eat, the carrion, bird, the carrion animals. And I thought, well, actually, it's not too bad being killed on the, in, on the field of battle and being left for the wolf and the eagle. But being killed in your own house and left by your neighbors to be eaten by the town dogs, that's kind of squalid, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. So mm. I think uh, we've got to say that uh, this was the kind of historical period you didn't want to be in. Um, and that no doubt powered the trauma and the urge to get out of here, which uh, I think um, is what happened. So uh, uh, all this is, uh, there, there are quite a lot of little bits of corroboration which come up. One of the big historical events which w must have taken place, is that uh, Sweden, the Kingdom of Sweden, now includes uh, the area of the Yeats, who in the poem are the deadly enemies of the Swedes. That's because the Swedes won. Um, in the same way as the clash between the Danes and the Jutes was won by the Danes, which is why Jutland is in Denmark, and Gothland is in Sweden. Sweden, the land of the Swedes. So... Um, uh, when did this take place? Well, one of my informants, uh, Professor uh, Martin Rundqvist, he, he investigated all this, and he, um, he found a lot of interesting things. But the, the main thing was that he said that in the, in the borderland between southern, what's now southern Sweden and what's now northern Sweden, which was then Gothland and, and Sweden proper, uh, there is a kind of um, absence of continuity. Um, there's quite good continuity from Roman times up to, well, the mid-6th century, and then there isn't continuity anymore. And he says it looks as if 
all these uh, all these estates acquired new owners. And he said rather carefully, uh, in the Dark Ages, uh, land was not usually appropriated in an undramatic fashion. In other words, he doesn't think that these guys sold out or moved to the seaside or something like that. He thinks that um, uh, they were killed and, uh, and, uh, uh, and invaders took over. So there was a kind of Swedish conquest, and that is what is over the horizon at the end of Beowulf. But it does look as if that really happened. Um, and that's why Sweden is now called Sweden. Dr. Shipping, I have a quick question for you. In, in your book, uh, you mentioned the, uh, a very brief mention about the name Beowulf and what it actually means. Now, I always thought it meant Beowulf, but it seems that uh, it yeah, doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that. And um, well, is it to do with a god? What, what, what do you think about the name? Well, um, I always liked the Beowulf theory that Beowulf, frankly, looks like a bloody bear. Um, he looks very like Beorn in The Hobbit, who is a bloody bear. Uh, he's extremely strong. He's not much good with weapons. He's a very good swimmer, as polar bears are. Uh, and um, uh, he had a bad reputation when he was young, which is what happens with bears' sons, because they're not very civilized. Okay, so uh, I I'm quite happy with the Beowulf is the bear. Um, but... Um, it's a, it's, I've got to say, it's a kind of an odd name, though not, not perhaps as completely unparalleled as, as people say. But uh, the argument is that it's not Beowulf, it's Beowulf, uh, uh, or Beowulf. And the first bit is the god who is kind of, well, the mythical figure, who is kind of mentioned early on in the poem, who is called uh, Beow or Beow, uh, which means barley. Um, so you've got a guy who is Shield, the son of Sheaf, and his son is called Barley. Well, hang on, Sheaf, Barley. It looks like we're looking at some kind of fertility deity here, doesn't it? Well, don't know. But that's the theory that uh, that bear wolf really means the the wolf. That is the uh, the servant, uh, the the, uh, the the follower of Baal, the god. Um, uh, well. Uh, um, I'm okay with that. Uh, what, what I think is possibly the original meaning was the follower of the god Beo, but after the god Beo had been completely forgotten, uh, somebody reinterpreted it as the wolf of the bees, the bear, and attached it to a story about a weir bear. And I still think that Beowulf is a kind of weir bear. There's another thing besides the, uh, the, 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 the swimming and the, and the strength and so on, which is uh, at one point he says he killed the standard bearer, the champion of the Franks. And he says, um, uh, the edge did not kill him. My warlike grasp crushed, broke his house of bones and crushed out the pulses of his heart. Now, what's your house of bones? It's your rib That's cage, a bear isn't hug. it? Yep. That's a yep. bear hug. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for saying it. I was going to say that, but, uh, but you, you deduced it yourself. It's a bear hug. <clears throat> Beowulf is, kills people by either ripping their arms off, as with Grendel, or by bear hugging them. Um, and uh, every time he tries to use a sword, it bounces off or it breaks. Uh, and the poet says, yes, yeah, so that's because... He was too strong, you know, he, he couldn't really use civilized weapons. So I think that the, in my opinion, the evidence is slightly towards the wolf of the bees, the, the honey eater uh, theory. Uh, but that may be a kind of um, uh, a very early mistake uh, caused by forgetting the name of a really unimportant god. Uh, Tolkien kind of wrote about this in a way. Um, in his poem in The Lost Road, that's, I think that's volume three of History of Middle Earth, in a poem called King Sheep. Volume five. Volume <laughs> five. Okay, I always get that wrong. Okay, volume five it is. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrote about this poem, King Sheave, which is about Sheaf, the father of King Shield, uh, who is the ancestor of the Shieldings, possibly. Um, 
but uh, Tolkien obviously had uh, quite complex theories about the uh, the uh, the early mythical status of uh, of South Scandinavia, you might say. And I've tried to, I've tried to work that out mm-hmm. as far as I can, and uh, and it's in the, the the memorial volume for Christopher. Um, I forget what it's called now, mm. something like King Sheev, I guess. Um, so I, I put what I thought yep. in there. But that's the kind of big mystery of, uh, of Tolkien studies, I think. <laughs> what, what, what did he think he was doing trying to write The Lost Road? Because he spent a lot of time and effort on it, and we still don't really know what his, what his intention was. Um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that gives you a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a, uh, uh, an inkling about it. I think you've got to use the word <laughs> inkling here. Um, mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, what else? I'm just wondering if there's anything else that I really wanted I, to say. Um, 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 I mentioned up okra. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Shippy, if you, uh, if you yeah, would like sure. it. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so you're, you're talking about, um, where the word Beowulf comes from and where, uh, you, you alluded yeah. to Bayorn and the Hobbit, yeah. it, you know, obviously Bayorn and the Hobbit is if people are looking for the Beowulf influence, that's an easy one. Um, what yeah. would you say about if people are looking for Beowulf and the Lord of the Rings, would, would they look to a character like Boromir oh, yeah. or would they be, would they need to look somewhere else? Yeah. Well, the, the really, the really uh, dead obvious one in a way is that uh, when Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli approach uh, the Meduseld of uh, of uh, uh, Theoden King, uh, because the, the 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 kind of sequence of events there is uh, exactly what happens in Beowulf. It's sort of uh, a, a demonstration of heroic etiquette. Um, you turn up, and uh, first you've got to get past the uh, the the kind of the coast guard, and then when you get there, you've got to try and get past the porter, the 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 door guard. And uh, uh, how how do you get past the door guard? Well, in Beowulf, uh, the, the problem is that they've got no they've got no documents, they've got no authenticators, and uh, in in Tolkien it's the same. And in both cases, the decision is uh, made by the door guard uh, quoting a proverb, and the proverb in Beowulf has <laughs> has foxed people for many many years. Uh, and I actually interpret it by saying, oh, well, I don't know what it means either, but I know what Tolkien <laughs> thought it meant because he gives a version of the same proverb at exactly this moment. And in Tolkien, what he says is, uh, in doubt, a man of worth will trust to his own wisdom. In other words, uh, I've got to make a decision because uh, that's my job. And I'm making the mm-hmm. decision. These guys are OK. Pass on, mm-hmm. you know, friend. Um, yeah. So uh, 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 clearly, Tolkien is modelling his uh, his his approach scene on, on Beowulf. Um, and uh, the other thing, I think, you know, uh, th- this is this is highly speculative, and uh, I can't Ooh, prove any of that's it. That's great. Um, but uh, we know that Tolkien, uh, when he started Lord of the Rings, he, he didn't know what was going to happen. He just started, uh, and. Uh, he, got all these funny ideas like uh, having a, a, a strange hobbit called Trotter, who eventually became Strider. Um, but it, it was really a kind of, it's really a kind of road story, isn't it? They follow the, the same trail as the Hobbit till they get to Rivendell, and then they, they go off in a different direction from, from Rivendell. Uh, but it's still not at all clear, um, you know, how this is going to work. Um, but I think that's because Tolkien uh, had not figured out an answer to a problem that no one else noticed. And the problem was, why do all the dwarves have Old Norse names? They can't possibly have had Old Norse names. So why, why have they got them? Well, we know that it's because Tolkien cribbed them out of, uh, out of an Old Norse poem. But eventually he decided that the reason they had Old Norse names, while the hobbits had kind of English names, was that back in the past, the dwarves had been associated with humans who were kind of related to the people who surrounded the hobbits. So the hobbits learned a version of Old English, which eventually became modern English, and the, de- the, the dwarves learned a version of Old Norse, which they held on to, as well as their own secret language. And once Tolkien had got this figured out, 
which was actually sort of uh, fairly well on in the Fellowship of the Ring. He thought, OK, uh, now I've got this figured out. Uh, I can introduce people who are like, old, like Anglo-Saxons, and those are the riders. The riders are Anglo-Saxons, and their language is kind of related to the hobbits. And, you know, Third and King notices it and says, you know, some of your words are not what I would use, but they certainly seem familiar. Um, and that's right, because they're, as it were, two branches of the same thing. But the dwarves branched off much earlier uh, and, uh, and in a different direction. But that gave Tolkien uh, carte blanche, you know, the liberty to bring in all kinds of material from Anglo-Saxon and from Old Norse, because he'd got it straightened out in his head. Um, and it's typical, I think, that Tolkien couldn't go on till he'd solved a linguistic problem. Once he'd solved the linguistic problem, it was okay. Well, uh, gosh, I've forgotten what the question was I was answering. Uh, um, but uh, uh, I but think I you did I've a fantastic it. job with that. <laughs> yeah, you did. Okay. You did, Dr. Shibby. That was awesome. I'm just, just looking again to see if I've uh, got anything I would like to um, throw at you. Gosh, I can't read my own writing is one of the problems. Um, but uh, uh, I just say that... problem um, in this industry. I, <laughs> I know, yeah. I mentioned Professor Haskend of Uppsala. I mentioned Professor Rundquist of Lodz. Uh, but uh, I also got uh, a good help from Dr. Ljungqvist uh, of Uppsala and from uh, Oli Kastholm, who runs the museum at Leira. And uh, also, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, I, I quoted uh, another uh, Danish professor called Professor Neesman. Um, actually, I think, he, I think he is a Danish professor working in Sweden. Um, but uh, uh, there's really quite a lot written now about what they call the um, the crisis of the migration period, the migration era crisis, which is what I call a central cultural trauma uh, in the mid sixth century. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, um, obviously a crisis like that doesn't happen everywhere at the same time. And it may be that in many places it doesn't happen at all. Um, uh, things don't, don't go as neatly as that. But I think if we're th thinking about Vikings, you, you need to remember that um, their psyche was perhaps conditioned by a really bad disaster in the past. And that perhaps accounts for the um, gloomy aspect of their mythology and the kind of um, the Ragnarok theory. And also, not just the Ragnarok theory, but uh, the Fimbulwinter. The Fimbulwinter is the is the winter which goes on and on and on and on, uh, and when there are no summers. And I think that's a mythological event, but it's actually surely a memory of a real event. Um, so that uh, this uh, period of crisis, which I think Beowulf describes, was actually also hanging around in the background of the, uh, the, 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 the migration period of the Vikings. Um, and perhaps it makes them slightly more sympathetic. Um, they were obviously horrible people whom you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, but that's because they'd had <laughs> a bad time themselves. Um, and although they were horrible people who wouldn't meet in a dark alley, I'm happy to say that, uh, that, that, uh, that we taught them a lesson. Um, just a few miles from where I live, uh, there's uh, they, they they found uh, they found a pit with um, 54 skeletons in it, um, and none of them had a head. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a pit not far away, they found 51 heads, 54 skeletons, 51 heads, uh, and they were all Scandinavians. Um, and yeah, I can only think, you know, that uh, if you go raiding uh, from your Viking ships don't get too far from the sea, boys, or they'll cut you off. Um, and what happened to the three heads? Yeah, literally. Well, what would you do if you, just, if you just beheaded 54 Vikings? Well, I myself would get some stakes and put them on the ridge where everybody could see them, and then I'd put a head on each one. Um, yeah. Seems, that's a deterrent. Seems natural behavior to me, yeah. And that, of course, is exactly, uh, you know, the, the, the pits are exactly on a ridge which you can see from both sides from a long way away so uh um that i think is um what should we say uh viking age public relations 
<laughs> Succinctly put. Well, anyway, so uh, I think uh, after that, people must have been saying, oh, yeah, guys, uh, raiding England, good money, but you've got to watch yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of risky. Yeah, too good. I'm glad they thought that. I wonder, should any, well, should I say anything more about Tolkien, which is what we're interested in? Um, I, I do think that Tolkien's posthumous works, uh, edited by other people, do deserve much more study. Uh, he had a lot of good ideas, of which I've mentioned only, uh, you know, a, a couple uh, about Beowulf, but he had a lot of good ideas about everything. Um, but as I said, he tended not to finish things, and he tended not to publish things. And I just wonder uh, how much he wrote and how much he gave away to other people, because he was a very uh, good supervisor of graduate students. And I mm-hmm. think he gave a lot of help to people like Simon Dardenne and Mary Salou. Uh, and they, they, uh, they agree with me. They, they, they say the same thing. Um, but uh, I think a lot of his thought has been kind of um, buried a bit by, by uh, being passed on to other people. Um, so I think we should, uh, we should look rather harder at, uh, at, his, uh, uh, at the posthumous publications. Um, which are really quite hard to read, as I've been saying, but uh, but it's worth a try. Um, so that I think is a uh, kind of the open frontier of Tolkien studies, mm-hmm. same as archaeology is the open frontier of Beowulf studies. Mm-hmm. We're not going to find any more documents, but we might well find some more halls and some more uh, strange uh, discoveries. Strange discoveries. St- I mean, s- some discoveries I. I've no idea what they did it for. I mean, here's one. Um, a hall like Herot, okay? Um, mm-hmm. He built it, okay? You know, big public relations, you know, uh, showing you've arrived. Why would you put uh, little pieces of gold foil in the holes on which you put the timbers which are going to hold the house up? And the pieces of gold foil... Um, appear to be images of some kind of divine marriage. Hmm. Well, that's what they did. Um, uh, what, what, what's going on here? Uh, uh, I, I, I really have no idea. Um, uh, but yeah. uh, there are these kind of mysteries that, uh, that, uh, that crop up, and only slowly do people um, evolve explanations for them. Uh, I really would like. I really would like to, to to show some of these things to Tolkien and say, "Look, Tolkien, what do you make of that?" Uh, <laughs> because I'm sure he would have some very good ideas that I haven't got. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you, right? Well, it's a pity. It's a pity. Um, uh, he really was uh, a most original thinker, uh, and he solved problems no one else could. Uh, but we're still left with a lot of problems which he didn't solve for us, and that's a pity. Unfortunately, I wish I could read uh, Old English, but I can't. So I can't read Beowulf in the original. What sort of translation, if any, do you recommend that people should well, read? I, do you yeah. Have yeah, yeah. Well, I've been thinking about this. Uh, and the problem with translating Beowulf, in my opinion, is that a lot of it doesn't mean very much. Um, that's because uh, it's uh, an alliterative poem, uh, and it has very strict metrical rules. And the poet, I think, often and quite naturally, um, uh, put something in which uh, fitted the metrical structure and carried the alliteration and the stress, but didn't actually kind of mean anything very much. Um, so uh, a major activity of Beowulf editors has been to... Uh, devise some kind of translation which more or less fits but but it never never fits all the way um Mm -hmm. so uh uh i I would say that actually the the problem is this uh we're we're translating something where a lot of the words don't really mean very much but what they're there for is to is to other words to keep up the rhythm and the beat and also to express the ethos of the group to express the ethos of the group. And that's what it does very powerfully and uh, very consistently. And the group, of course, is uh, the king's armed retainers. Uh, 
and uh, they are the ones who are interested in weapons and armor and mathems uh, and uh, also have conflicts of loyalty and kinship, which they are very interested in discussing and are also very interested in, shall we say, etiquette and court behavior and uh, the right kind of thing to do and politeness. And uh, one of their habits is, and this is this doesn't go very well with academics these days, academics, I don't like academics, academics <laughs> uh, like to say things at length in great detail with footnotes and to make everything completely explicit. <clears throat> but I think uh, the, uh, the audience of Beowulf like to say things out of the corner of their mouth rather, rather uh, uh, elliptically and see whether you're clever enough to figure out what they're saying. Um, <laughs> they're, uh, they're oblique speakers. And if you don't listen very hard, uh, you don't know what they mean. But I would think that actually, if you were living in a war band full of heavily armed, truculent guys, uh, listening very hard was a very important survival skill. Because if you fail to take a hint, that could be fatal. So uh, Beowulf is a poem in which many hints are dropped. And as I say, mm. Tolkien was particularly good at picking these up and sticking them together. Um, and that's the way to do it. Uh, you're not going to get a, a you know, a kind of uh, 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 start to finish explanation with footnotes. You've got to try and figure out what he means by uh, the, uh, the hints and allusions. Um, and that's, that's the problem with translating it. Um, uh, it wasn't meant for people like us. Uh, so we, all we can do is, uh, is get as close as we can. I always look at Tolkien's translation because uh, he was an original thinker, whereas a lot of the translators these days, if you ask me, uh, they're working by getting half a dozen earlier translations, reading them, and kind of figuring out some kind of common denominator. They don't actually have opinions mm. of their own at all. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of cut and paste system. Oh, well, Tolkien didn't do that. He, he, he always thought about everything. Yeah, so. That's why his lectures never got to a finish. He was still thinking about a word in line 43. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> but that's a, that's a valuable, uh, a valuable thing to do as well. Um, so that's, 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 I, I'm actually going to write this up about translating Beowulf, but I, I've got to, got to get my evidence together first. Um, which at the moment is not in my mind. Mm. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Well, I'm very happy that you picked talking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Shib, I've, I've, I've one last question to, to, yeah. to give to you. Um, well, actually it's a, it's a two part question. Uh, first part is about Beowulf. Um, the second part's about Tolkien. The, my first question, I've always been fascinated and you alluded to this in your, in your new book about how the poets, they sort of drop all these names in of people that we have no idea who they are. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I was, I'm, I'm always, I've always been interested in that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why the poets did this. Um, and then my second, my second question is a, it's a little bit easier. It's um, we're a, you know, this is a, a, a Tolkien collectors YouTube channel. Um, do you have any Tolkien items that you're particularly proud of? Huh, yeah. Well, um, the first question about the names, uh, there's two possibilities. Uh, one is that uh, the poet used these many, many names, you know, something like 70 in the poem, uh, just because he knew who they were. Uh, and he thought everybody mm -hmm. else knew who they were. And so it was just actually uh, expressing common knowledge. And the other uh, theory is to say that um, in Anglo-Saxon society, uh, when you introduced yourself, you said, you know, uh, uh, I am so-and-so, son of so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, grandson of so-and-so. Uh, so everybody has to be kind of mm. authenticated and say a bit about his pedigree. And so the poet could have been making up pedigrees to kind of anchor mm. his, uh, his characters in the poem. Um, and uh, the one doesn't exclude the other. Sometimes he might have been doing one, sometimes he might have been doing the other. But on the whole... I suspect that a lot of the names he mentions were actually uh, people who, of whom there was still some memory. Uh, 
And so uh, they were kind of, um, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of helped to stitch the poem together and to anchor it uh, mm. in the minds of the audience. After all, he says right at the start, we have heard of the power of the kings of the Spear Danes. And he obviously expects his audience to nod and say, yeah, sure, we do. Uh, of course, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but if the audience did, then a lot of these things probably made sense to them, which they, unfortunately, don't always to us. But sometimes they do. And it's pure chance whether we get a cross bearing on the name or we don't. And I think that pure chance element suggests that uh, it's, a, it's a feature of our, um, our limited information. Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. I wrote an article about this, which I called uh, Onomastic Redundancy in Beowulf. And the editor said, oh, that's far too bloody clever. He said, we'll call it Names in Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon England. <laughs> but I, I prefer my title, Onomastic Redundancy. There's too many bloody names. So why are there too many bloody names? Well, that's my, that's my question. Um, well, that's the, uh, the, the bit that about the name. That is a better name, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as for Tolkien... Uh, 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 articles. Well, I wish I had some more, you know. Uh, I really did not make the most mm -hmm. of my opportunities. But I have a, a, a treasured letter from Tolkien, uh, which I very carefully mm -hmm. preserved, uh, and it's in a in a glass frame. And I kept the uh, I kept the envelope too, and it's all handwritten. Uh, and so that's a, a very Excellent. prized possession of mine. Um, but I just think, you know, uh, on my shelf back there there's a, a kind of box set of uh, the first edition of lord of the rings um and one of the the, the bad things about it is that uh, i hadn't got any money at the time uh, i couldn't buy lord of the rings until i won a book prize so i won a book prize at the school tolkien school i'm wearing the old edge tie you know um and uh, mm -hmm. they, they took it away and they took the dust jacket off so they could stamp the school stamp on it so i got Three mm. volumes of the first edition. One of them doesn't have a dust jacket, but it does have the school stamp, uh, as I say, of King Edward's school. Mm, well, that, yep. that so, makes it unique. So but that's your original set. Why didn't I ask Tolkien to sign yep. it? Uh, if I'd done that, well, that would, yeah. have, uh, that would have been a very treasured possession. Um, uh, mm. I've also got a, 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 a Hobbit first edition, but it's the first American edition. But that's quite interesting because, of course, the first edition's really quite different from the third edition, which is the one that we all know in some respects. So I'm pleased to have that as well. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 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 I, I, and of course, I've picked up things from Tolkien conferences over the years, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, plaques and presentations and things like that. I just got one, actually, from the... Uh, from the Italian Tolkien Society, which is a, a dragon model, um, a, a, a model of Ooh. the dragon of Jotsa, uh, whose name was mm. Fierstan. Um, but apparently uh, uh, Dotsa has its own famous dragon, and uh, it's the emblem of the city, and they gave me a, a statue uh, of, the, of the dragon. So things like that I, I keep. Um, That's awesome. I have, some, I have some really awful things as well. The, the ugliest yep. possession I've got is a, is a bust of H.P. Lovecraft, which was uh, given to me by uh, the, the, the Fantasy Society. And gosh, Lovecraft, if he was as ugly as that, uh, uh, well, I'm kind of sorry for him. Um, however, he is I keep not a photogenic man. Sake. No, not a photogenic man. Not, not at all. Um, <laughs> but a great writer in his way, in his very strange way. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks, guys. Good to see you all. Uh, Chad, Trotter, Dr. Shippey. Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you Good so much you. for coming on. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. We really appreciate your time. And, and it's, it's yeah. been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much. Hey, hey I'll tell you one thing. Thank you. You, you know, this, uh, this little book of mine, uh, about mm -hmm. half an hour ago, or maybe an hour ago, I, I looked it up on Amazon to see uh, how much they were selling it as a Kindle item. And it was seventy-eight pounds thirty-two p. That's ridiculous! <laughs> ridiculous! Seventy-eight pounds. Um, uh, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on. Tomorrow morning will be 
Monday. That's okay. I'm going to get onto the publisher and say, what the <laughs> hell? Is this some kind of misprint? Should it really be £7.83, not £78.30? Um, uh, who the hell would no buy... one's going to buy it at that price. <laughs> no. That's right. Anything yeah. on Kindle. Mm. No, no, no. Dear me. Um, uh, sometimes, sometimes I wonder, you know, what... Well, uh, you know, I, well, I wonder what the marketing I don't think process we've said really this. is. Uh, I don't think we have said no, this, no, but the I'll book is excellent. And... We do recommend yeah. that everyone goes out and gets a copy because it's we do really yeah good book. and you can you Absolutely. can buy it at all the major retailers for less than yeah, less than right. seventy eight pounds. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Well, I'm glad to hear don't, don't get the Kindle the version. <laughs> buy the book. Yeah, buy it. the book. That's it. Good. Yeah.